Um, our scripture this morning is second, or I'm sorry, First Timothy chapter two. We're going to be looking at verses one through six. So while you're finding that, First uh, Timothy chapter two. Um, today we're going to be looking at this scripture with the realization that I must be thankful for Jesus' sacrifice and pray that others receive him. Now, a little bit of background on our passage here. 1 Timothy is one of the three books of the New Testament known as the pastoral epistles. Anybody got to guess what the other two are? Well, 1 Timothy being a clue, um, you know, the, the second, 2 Timothy would be the other one. And the third one is Titus. Now, you may remember, because last week we concluded the book of Acts, yay, after working through it for many months. But when we concluded Acts, Paul was in prison in Rome, and Timothy, 1 Timothy would have, been really, would have been written after that imprisonment. Paul was traveling again, discovers that problems have arisen, in particular, in this case, with the church in Ephesus. So he wrote this letter to Timothy to encourage him and to tell him things that needed straightened up in Ephesus. He addresses things like false teaching. He addresses things like church leadership and conduct during the worship service. And it's in that context that our scripture today falls in. And again, it's uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And as is our custom here, uh, if you would please rise in reverence to the reading of the word of the Lord. 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1, we read, First of all, then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Let's pray. Merciful Father, we thank you for sending your son to live a life that we cannot possibly live and to die as the sacrifice for our sins. And we thank you for this passage that you've given us today. We ask that we may learn from it and that we might be transformed by it. We ask this in the name of your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. I don't know how many of y'all have heard of a guy named David Platt, um, but for a while he he served as the uh, president of the Southern Baptist Convention's International Mission Board. So, um, you know, very very good leader. Um, and he's now serving as the pastor of McLean Bible Church in Vienna, up in Northern Virginia, that um, that neck of the woods. But uh, in June of 2019, he's preaching the morning service there and gets told about, you know, gets called backstage about the end of the service to be told that President Trump was stopping by and wanted the church to pray for him. So David Platt <laughs> brought, the <pre> <coughs> excuse me, brought the president on stage and prayed for him. Now, there were a lot of people in the congregation very upset by this, very hurt by this, because I don't know if you all realize this, uh, that was kind of a controversial president, you may remember. But, but, but Platt, what he did in making that decision, he decided that obeying the scriptural teaching was the right call. And that, you know, part of that his reasoning for that was contained in this passage. So today we're going to examine what 
obedience to this passage of scripture means for us. And, you know, normally I phrase these things as I statements. Today we're going to do them as we statements because this is really involves the whole congregation. This is not... We're not looking at this with, you know, from the point of view of individuals today. We're looking at this as a group. And the first thing we notice is that we must pray thankfully. And this is a good time of year to be talking about thankfulness. Now, the first thing we read in our passage here in verse 1, uh, first of all, that's the first thing we notice, right? First of all. Now, Paul is beginning a new section in this passage, and it's a section that talks about the conduct of the church. So, first of all, in his section about the conduct of the church, means that this is his primary concern in this section. Now, first of all, again, what we're told is that, you know, I urge petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings to be made for everyone. This is his primary concern. And while this can and it actually should be applied to our individual prayers, we should, you know, as we're praying at home, in our, you know, at our kitchen tables or at our prayer closets or wherever, wherever it is you choose to pray when you're on your own, that's not the context here. The context here is within the body of believers. Now, the next passage, you know, after this talks about the conduct of men and women in the worship service. So we know, you know, based on that, that he's not, again, talking about individuals. The chapter before this, he's talking about false teaching. And Paul doesn't say, well, you know. He doesn't write this letter in a way that says, okay, we're going to apply these verses to the church, these verses to individuals, and then these verses to the church again. That would be a terribly disorganized way to write. And Paul was not disorganized in his writing. So the whole book really applies to church life. We want to make sure we're holding on to that straight. So... What the Holy Spirit has inspired the Apostle Paul to say in this passage is that the church must be a praying church. Note the words he uses. Petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings. Now, a lot of this, you know, a lot of people read this, a lot of, a lot of really super duper smart people try to take each of those and well this means this and you know they're really I mean yes and they can be different kinds of prayers but realistically they're prayers we don't have to we don't have to analyze each one of those and break them down and you know and I'm I'm not trying to come up with some sort of you know, ritualistic list we have to obey. You know, I don't believe that's what's being called for here. But what he is saying in this passage is that the church must be a praying church. And part of that command to be a praying church is that we must pray thankfully. Again, I'm glad I got this, uh, I got this passage at this time of year. We should be praying in thankfulness for a lot of things. And I think a lot of us are pretty good at being thankful. We're, you know, we recognize our blessings. We do. We recognize, you know, we're blessed with, you know, food and homes and things like that. But maybe we don't often stop to think about being thankful for our salvation. How often do we really stop and consider that? How often do we really stop and consider the sacrifice? And we just kind of, you know, we just kind of live on, you know, our daily lives. So we should be praying in thankfulness for our salvation. But we're also, in verse 2, told, and this may be kind of hard for some of us, 
We are to pray thankfully for our leaders because that verse 2 is part of the same sentence. You notice there's no period there. It's part of the same sentence because Paul writes in super long sentences. Have, you, have any of y'all ever noticed that? A modern English teacher would be like, break this up. Because <laughs> Paul, you know, and, and when we added verses and stuff later on, you know, sometimes, you know, two or three verses will be one sentence, or sometimes the sentence will carry on over a chapter break because they didn't really have punctuation back then. But, so this is a continuation of verse 1. We are to pray thankfully for our leaders, and specifically he puts, for kings and those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all dignity. Isn't that a great idea? Living a quiet and tranquil, tranquil life. How many of y'all want to live a quiet and tranquil life? <laughs> Anybody want anybody want to live a hectic, busy life that's where you're overwhelmed by things? No, you don't. <laughs> and and I, I believe a lot of you are living quiet and tranquil lives in all dignity. Part of the reason that we're able to do that is because of our system of government. And again, it's a good thing, you know. Even even if you know we don't necessarily like the person who's in charge at any given time. We are to pray thankfully for them. We are to seek their welfare. We're told in verse 3 that this is good and pleases our Savior. And so it's a command. It's something that must be done. And this is written over and over in Scripture. And how many of you think, well, that might be kind of difficult right now. I don't like the guy in charge. Do you ever, do you ever, what, whether, whether you don't like the guy in charge now or you don't like the guy in charge next, trust me, somebody's going to, eventually we're going to have a leader that you don't like. Whether at the federal level, at the state level, at the, you know, even at maybe the town council level, well, y'all, yeah, most of y'all look, don't live in the town, but you know, county supervisors, I think y'all have out here. At some point, there are going to be leaders who have policies that you don't particularly like, but we're still to pray in thankfulness for those in authority. It can be hard, I'll admit it, but I'll put this in perspective. When Paul was writing this, the Roman Empire was being ruled by Nero, who, by the way, then would you know would go on to blame the Christians when Rome burnt down. He would torture and execute a lot of them. You know, even to the point of, at, at one point, you know, pouring the, you know dipping them in tar basically and using them as you know lighting them on fire and using them as torches on the street. Things that don't happen to us. So if Paul can clearly command that with a government structure like was going on then, and I say Paul, but it was Paul being divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit, so it's a command of God, then we can, you know, we can hold to that attitude much easier now in our present circumstances. Now, that doesn't mean that we, you know, necessarily just accept things as they are. We work toward change. You know, we exercise our rights, things like that. But we are still to have an attitude of gratitude for those in authority. Now, in addition to praying thankfully, and again, you know, that's thankful for all these things mentioned, we must also pray boldly. Now, again, if we look back in verse 1. We see something mentioned. We see petitions and intercessions. Anybody know what those mean? You know what a petition is, right? It's, you know, when you ask for something. 
And intercession is when you intervene on behalf of somebody else. So using these together, we're commanded to ask God for things. Of course, these things we ask for have to be within his will. You know, that's the only right and proper request. But we do get to ask him for things. Now, again, intercessions, you know, is when we ask for something for someone else. We do that all the time here. We have a big list of people that we are continually praying for, for healing from an illness, for healing from bro broken bones, for, you know, recovery from all sorts of things. And a lot of us even have... Yeah, how, a lot of us even have the uh, who's your one, but we'll get on to that in a minute. But we often, often come together to ask for things for other people. And this is not wrong. Now, of course, we do see God's will in this. You know, and I, I want to be very careful that I don't come across as one of those and y'all have heard these, the name it and claim it preachers. I, you know, we are always, always subject to God's will. God is not subject to our will. And, you know, we don't rub a lamp and, you know, he comes out with a puff of smoke to do what we command. That is not how the God of the universe works. But we are commanded to make intercession for people. Actually, James also addressed this in his book in chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person and the Lord will raise him up if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So clearly, we are to be a praying people. And a lot of that praying that we are doing is not intended to be for ourselves. I don't know if any of you all ever taught middle schoolers. I did a time, you know, I did several years teaching middle schoolers at church, you know, doing the middle school ministry. And some of the prayer requests that you get working with that particular group are things like, pray that I do well on a test. <laughs> Did you study for that test? Well, no. <laughs> You're probably not going to do well on it. <laughs> you know, pray for healing for my dog. I always get I always had a hard time with that one, but I would do it. <laughs> but more often, this is not about us. This is about us as believers in community, lifting up each other to the Lord. By the way, these prayers, these intercessions, these aren't just for people in the church. They are for people in the church, but not just for people in the church, not just for our families. Read verse 1 again. I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone. Well, who does everyone include? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, I don't know too many other ways to say it. Everyone. What about um, that person you don't like? That, that, that neighbor that plays his music too long. Well, Y'all don't really have that problem here, do you? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, have, I have that. I have a, behind my house, catty corner, I have a guy who likes to, and judging by his music taste, he's obviously a redneck, but likes to have very loud parties. 
not e not even like a classic redneck, you know, not like um not like the good old country music, like you know, uh, like Florida Georgia Line type stuff. <laughs> but y'all know what I'm talking about. That's why the, the that's why some of y'all are looking at each other like, mm hmm. None of y'all are my neighbor. <laughs> But pray for those who annoy you. That, that co-worker you can't stand. For that, that person who cut you off on 95. That, that rude receptionist at the doctor's office. That family member that you really don't want to come to Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> Moving on from there. <laughs> For everyone, we are to intercede for these people. We're given a good reason for that. Which is that God our Savior wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We should be praying for the salvation of people we don't like. You know, what's the worst thing that happens out of that? They get they come to know Christ, then you lose an enemy, you gain a you gain a brother in Christ. Is that a, such a terrible thing? I loved how Patty taught during Sunday school. And by the way, if you're not attending Sunday school, you're missing out. We got really good Sunday school teachers now. Well, we always have, but <laughs> but we do, but <laughs> but we have some really good teachers who really put a lot of time and effort into these lessons and presenting them. But one of the things that Patty mentioned in our in chapter three of Colossians was about our words being gracious and being seasoned with salt. We're to demonstrate love to these people. Even these people we don't like. Even these people who annoy us. And the reason for that is so that we don't inhibit them from coming to Christ. I can't tell you how many people I know who have been turned off by Christians who treated them badly. We can't do that. We must also, moving on, we must also pray evangelistically. Verses 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. Y'all ever think about this? It does no good for a lost person to pray. If a person doesn't have Christ, they, God doesn't hear their prayers. You ever think about that? People who are lost do not know Christ or even that they need him. But you know who does? We do. We have a duty to pray for those who are lost. Now, in John 14, 6, we read, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We have to keep that truth. We need to pray for people that the Holy Spirit will draw them to him. That's one of our duties. Again, we read in verses 3 and 4 of our passage, This is good and it pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. we got to be careful how we look at that verse. This does not mean that everyone will be saved in the end. And there are, there are people who try to argue that. You know, God did not direct that everybody's automatically saved. 
If he did, there'd be no point. We can just do whatever we wanted. But that's not the case. What it means is that God wants everyone to believe. Well, if we don't give them that opportunity, and if we don't ask for that opportunity for them, how are they going to get it? How will they hear unless someone tells them? We must pray for those who are lost, and this can take a lot of dedication. How many of y'all remember the uh, Hoosier One series we did? That was that was in September of 2019. We did. That. I had to look it up to figure out when it was. So it's been over two years. If you care, by a show of hands, how many of you are still praying for the one? that you wrote on that paper at that time. Some of you still are, two and over two years later. It takes dedication. And I know some I know some others have told me they're still praying for their one. That's what's, you know, we are to pray. We're to be faithful, praying people. And what would happen? Let's just let's just throw this at the wall and see if it sticks. What might happen if we prayed for the gospel to be presented to you know various world leaders? What about that? Sure, it might take some time, or they might ultimately reject. But can you imagine? Say, for instance, if. Um, Kim Jong-un got saved in North Korea. How much different would the lives of millions of people be? Or Xi Jinping of China? Or President Biden? And I'm not saying, you know, for example, I don't know him to be a believer or not. I know that, you know, I know that his archbishop is uh, threatening to withhold communion from him <laughs> but what about what would happen what has the potential to happen if we pray for those in authority if we ask for good for them if we ask for them to be reached with the gospel if we ask for the courage of the believers within their nation What would happen then? <clears throat> now, I know that oftentimes we are prone to make prayer kind of an automatic thing. We don't know, you know, maybe half-heartedly, you know, sometimes we don't take it as seriously as we should. And I know that probably for... At least some of you, every prayer that you say is followed by, please pass the potatoes. If not, you know, even better. But I know often people don't really care. They don't think of it as essential. They don't think of it as a God-given responsibility. And I know this, you know, for example, with, you know, the old-fashioned Wednesday night prayer meeting that a lot, you know, some churches still have. A lot of churches have gone away from it. But in the churches that still have that, they can expect only a fraction of their people to show up. Probably in the neighborhood of, you know, judging on ones I know, 10% or so of their people. We don't think of it as a duty. We think of it as just, you know, another thing. Or maybe maybe we think a prayer is just a time to ask God for what we want. Did any of you... I'm, I'm assuming most of y'all got past that middle school age where 
you know, every prayer was about, you know, Lord, please let me do well at this or, you know, please don't let this check I just wrote hit my account before my paycheck does. By the way, that has been my prayer in the past. Not recently, but back in the day when you could float checks. But we've grown since then, haven't we? Have we not grown enough to be a people who come together and pray earnestly for the lost, the dying, the hurting, for those in authority and control at various levels of government. Which is why I say to you, I think it is time for the church to take prayer and thankfulness more seriously. Now, I'm just going to ask you, you know, I, I have four questions I like to ask y'all occasionally just to just to gauge your responses, and these are not for me, these are for you. What is it that you hear God saying to you this morning? There is something, you know, every, every scripture message requires a response. So what's God saying to you? And then immediately on the heels of that, what was that thing that popped into your mind that keeps you from doing that? Because as soon as you thought of something, you thought of an obstacle to it. And what if, if you were going to do it, what might be a good first step? And then finally, and essentially, who are you going to tell? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Merciful Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that we can express our gratitude to you and that we are commanded to not just, not just be passive consumers of religious goods and services, but those who come to you faithfully and boldly in prayer, thanking you for those things that you've blessed us with, thanking you for our salvation and seeking that for others. And Father, we ask that if there is anyone listening today who does not know Christ as their Savior, we would ask that today would be the day they would come to know him. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our uh, invitation hymn this morning is going to be number 644, Count Your Blessings.